today's stage. Okay, let me uh, clear this. As you guys can tell, I'm running low on bandwidth. All right, so here we go. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of a breakdown. Now, the first thing we should do, I should do, is give a warning. Um, it's not possible to fit all of photonics, all of optics, all of uh, the firmware stack into a single presentation, but it's going to get dense. <laughs> so you can, you can pick your poison here. Um, now, it's uh, November 3rd. That'll be immediately important in one second. So, as I just stated, this talk will be dense. Then it'll be like mid-dense, as in it kind of gets worse unless you're really into this stuff. Um, and then it'll be clear, and then we wrap. And this is another explanation. So, I like to break things down into percentages. So, this is over single percentage technical. Some people might have experiences in this product uh, domain, but I guarantee you that it's at least 1% technical for you. And this is the part that's made as simple as possible, so we call it MySAP. Um, and so let's go. Now, where this all begins is, oh, well, myself, I'll do really quick. Um, I have a quick background in, so the top is the software, so VST plugins are virtual studio plugins, to data science, to, game, uh, to smart contracts, all the way down to where this is important, which is the, hard, which is the hardware section. Uh, I, I actually spent time in Singapore and Shenzhen building electric skateboards. So those are not PCB boards. I know we're at Supercon. But, uh, you know, we use PCBs, and I had to source them. And sure enough, through doing all of this, uh, I actually end up getting very, very embedded with headsets, which doesn't make too much sense until we get to some parts of this. All right, and that was the complex. Here is the uh, basic version. So I began the journey of uh, augmented reality in 2015, so we're almost at a decade. Um, and here's my start here. What's that date there? It's November 3rd. <laughs> so this is the eighth year anniversary of the hardware start. And now that looks, on the far right, looks like a headset for VR. I promise you it's not. It's just that the optics just weren't good enough uh, to prevent the transmissivity, to prevent, or sorry, to, to prevent the light escaping. So we had to basically have an external uh, shell. Um, all right. And so, uh, so it gets some, some of it gets into neuro. So here we go. Why this isn't Google Glass? Now, what has changed in the past X number of years? Uh, well, Google Glass launched in April of 2013. Sorry, yeah, 2020, or yeah 2013. Um, and so what happened here is that we have developed into the actual lens substrate. Here's a picture of uh, what that looked like when we had an oblong, what's called an oblonged uh, birdbath display. And so in this X amount of time, we have somewhat flushed out what it means to have a pair of smart glasses. Uh, on one side, we have weak smart glass, and the other side, we have strong smart glass. And this is really key because um, you'll see in the coming weeks, as I have friends who are applying for funding, uh, fit a device in to the small niche category that's like an AI glass. It doesn't actually do anything that's immersive, which would be qualified as a smart, strong glass, a smart um, a strong smart glass. Is, we're pulling this uh, framework from like AI, which used to be have a weak AI and a strong. So we're somewhere in between there with ChatGPT. Um, but now what's key about this is, here, here's the dense part. Um, this is where the HoloLens was seated. So I think if I get my years right, uh, 2016 is when they do the unveil. This is Alex Kipman, a uh, Brazilian guy who got pushed out. Um, and they had different types of optics than we do have today. It is a lesser form in which uh, the, the far right side, I wish I had a laser pointer, but this part is a MEM system. And what they had prior to that was a much more simpler solution, which was just a uh, projector that uh, routed light through a conduit, essentially. And then it's the culmination of the light is what was most important. This is different in the Hall Lens 2, where they actually spun um, a MEM system. So they're alternating a mirror, like around, I think it's 20,000 times per second. And by doing that, they're actually able to paint in the, paint in the display, paint in the light that you're supposed to be able to see on the other side. Um, and here's one of the systems broken down, so uh, you can kind of see here the, uh, oh, the laser pathway. The, what's really important to note here as well is that the optical engine, so you'll constantly hear me refer to a light engine. The light engine itself, the position keeps changing throughout all of these devices in history. Um, and so at the top of the HoloLens 2 is where the optical engine was, but on the uh, side and 
two wrapped a little bit around was the uh, Holland one. Um, and this is really important as well because you'll hear in this talk waveguide. The term waveguide is actually from the Israeli military. Uh, they developed some of the first waveguides in the 70s and 80s. And here you can see this is where the MEM system is located to basically push in that light down the, down the funnel of like the lens substrate. Um, okay. I got to spend a bit more time on some of these slides uh, just to make sure you guys are getting it because this is where it gets even more dense. <laughs> All right, so here we go. On one side, we have basically the exit point of all of the uh, different optical solutions. And on the left side, we have the image source. We have the light source. And here's basically the different options for the um, uh, laser beam, sorry, the uh, uh, light, light generation. And on the other side is basically what, how we're going to combine all this light to make something that is a salient image that doesn't just get bled out by uh, the natural uh, light of the, United, of the, um, the sun in the U.S. <laughs> okay. But uh, one quick thing. This is a quick shout-out to Carl. Uh, he, d he basically compiled a ton of this work. But for all intents and purposes, uh, when I went and started doing much of this in 2015 and 2016, I didn't have this. So, uh, yeah, for my age group, I happen to be the best in the nation for just specifically, uh, like, the waveguide optical stack. It's stacks in, the, um, in photonics. So here's the emission source. Now, what's really important about this is you'll see, oh, well, there's micro OLED and micro LED. It turns out that the emissivity of the micro OLED is actually not better even to the today standards, as it is then if you were to just go with micro LED, it ends up being um, much brighter. And then most importantly, it's actually, um, uh, it's more like packed. I, I know it's like counterintuitive here, but as everyone knows, you don't receive power to certain pixels of uh, the OLED. Well, while the micro LED, you, you do in a, in a way that's actually hyper efficient in comparison. Um, and let me make sure I'm not going over time here. So, uh, oh yeah, we we should probably talk about the L cost. So, one of the liquid crystal on silica. Uh, this is one option to get basically light from one point to another point in the glasses. Uh, this has been used for. I mean, it's been around for some serious time. But uh, magically, for example, their second iteration device thin thinned the L cost, and then one of these companies, Avant Garde, Avant Garde. Um, has caught up to that technology. However, Magic Leap is just simple, sorry, simply being uh, used now by Google to, to generate basically a device that's going to be a com combination between North Focals, which is a, can a Canadian company, and, a, um, and yeah, they heavily invested strategically into Magic Leap, so they're combining those two optics. Um, let's spend a little bit more time on the optics here, and then we'll break it all down to something way simpler. Um, so bird bath combiners. We saw a Google Glass that used birdbath, but it's, it was an oblonged birdbath display because at the time, birdbaths really weren't spun up in Shenzhen area, or the factories really weren't targeting birdbaths as a, as a profitable uh, venture. So birdbaths have since hit the market in um, devices such as Xreal. They rebranded. It used to be called Nreal. And they happen to be some of the best uh, efficiency in terms of power, but they really, really, really aren't the best in terms of look and the outward-facing uh, capability. So um, how am I doing on time? So, all right, so we're going to skip through most of this. It, the only thing that's pretty important on here is the holographic opti optical element uh, versus diffractive. And then uh, diffractive waveguides are at the top there. You can see holographic. Um, the, like North Focals, as mentioned, these were, had poor eye boxes, which in all tense of purposes is just the image that you can see uh, from the graphic. All right, we're going to make this simpler now. Oops, I went backwards because I dropped it. All right, so simpler portion. <laughs> um, here's what's happening in the AR VR industry. So we have on the left side VR. VR is a stack of pancakes. Why is this stack of pancakes? It's because all of the PCBs, the optics, uh, the uh, emission source for the light is front in front of the user's nose. So it's basically a, a stack of technology outward from the eye relief point to the back of the device. What's different 
is AR is actually an archer. Now, what an archer does is it shoots light around the side of the arm, and it might have to bend it one way or another up on the crossbar and spread it out through a waveguide. Uh, and at the very exit point, uh, the coupling in versus the coupling out, at the coupling out portion, the light has to make one more right turn. Where do you think that turn's going? It's going towards your eye. So these technologies are fundamentally different. It's, it's a, it strains me to a great extent that people kind of batch them into the same category. I will say that most people don't use VR. I, I'm a fan of it, but other, other people outside this room potentially uh, look at it as nonsense. And I understand where that, they're coming from from that. But in archery, this is a skill you can develop. This is a skill you can build. This is a skill that once you maybe get into the world with these devices, you're more accurate, right? OK. Now let's go on. So what devices are currently on the market that we actually can feel? <laughs> I got to try this one out uh, exactly 14 days ago. And then that one I haven't had a chance to. Uh, this is Project Orion on the right and Snapchat Spectacles on the left, fifth generation. Um, they're only their last two generations. The last one was in, fourth generation was in 2021 actually had any sort of optics in them. Uh, and that's why we addressed the fact that there's weak and strong smart glasses. They have climbed up the ladder of smart glasses, um, but they're still just not quite at this. Um, and for the reason being uh, that the Orion device uh, basically takes in, if anyone just saw the MKBHD video just posted yeah, yesterday, it takes in a lot more, a lot, lot more uh, input modalities. So you have your hand, you can have head pose. Uh, that little puck that sits on the ground is actually meant to orient the device itself to a, a global locked system. So that the device, device itself up, uh, offloads the app logic. And so all you're really doing here is you're functioning, is you're getting all of those little uh, aspects of the, such as the projector, the light engine, which is positioned right here, and you're just making sure that everything is synced together in a perfect uh, slam, um, uh, like, oh, slam is uh, spatial, sorry, uh, simultaneously, yeah, localization and mapping. And so, and so what's really key here is their demonstrations, they showed what? They showed a, uh, a Instagram scroll, and they showed fruit, and with labeled fruit, the graphics are geolocked. And then the last part was the Pong. And I think the Pong you could not run for the two hours that they tell you. All right, now this, asks, now this device, the fifth generation Snap Spectacles, oddly enough, they got bigger than the 2021 version. Um, there's good reason for that, but we'll just focus on this device for now. Uh, what's great about them is that when I got to try them, um, they're at least doing the pinch gestures, but they don't understand when not to detect the pinch gesture, as well as the pinch gesture also snaps to corners when you're just actually just trying to move throughout the interface a little bit better. But this is a hardware talk, so. Um, so here's the, uh, so, oh, by the way, when the devices are running, uh, it's, this is entirely self-contained, and so the battery, the uh, electronics, all the logic is running on the device itself. Um, they typically have like an outward facing, um, well they have two outward facing cameras to make it stereoscopic, but then at the same time, they're also concerned about the six DOF of your head. So it's, while it's a great device right now, uh, unless they are able to expand the product offering, there's no way this is gonna ship. And what I mean by expand the product offering I mean is probably slim the device down to figure out this perfect uh, nexus between comfort, weight, and uh, look, and looks. All right, so yeah, those are the two side by side. Um, uh, we built a, hmm, okay, so spatial computing, didn't really use the term uh, yet. Uh, spatial computing for anyone that's a, uh, in and out of this room, it's simple, it's just z-axis computing. We're used to doing everything with a y-axis and an x-axis, but now with a stereoscopic device, you can move about the space, and that's what's important. So we went on and built, um, this is kind of towards the end of it, because we're still working on it, <laughs> built a, uh, a machine learning model, which is speed and generation of time. Um, I'm, I'm gonna leave some of this off, because again, this is supposed to be hardware. Uh, let's see, I think this is about the end, and all right, so I publish everything under a spatial computing Bible, uh, which is a great way of just looking at everything as like a, capac a capacity gain versus a ability gain. Um, we have our own motion quantization engine, and then a lot of the updates, because I can't fit it all in, is under a blog called DLINE, and we have uh, two events a year, but mainly one summit a year. Uh, and as I close out here, um, yeah, Bob, okay. 
yeah, we don't have too much time for this. But the important part is the relatability of these devices. We don't see that just yet as a $25,000 device from Meta and something is too thick to be socially acceptable by Snapchat. And then the last aspect is um, we really only think that you're only going to have four devices at the end of the year, at the end of the day. Uh, you're only going to have a laptop, a phone, a glass, and potentially a neural interface. I think all the other devices come second or they're not on the list. And that's it. Oh, and I have the uh, handle uh, Spatial Computing. <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. So uh, on Discord, you can type in Spatial Computing. That's mine. On Twitter, as an example, uh, Reality Metadata as a backup. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>